All right, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of NFT Pirates. I'm here with the one and only, the biggest gun in our community, Taps Trades. What's up, my Thanks man? Thanks for having me, man. Buddy, thrilled that you're able to come on. I have to admit, I'm a, a little nervous just because, you know, I watched your channel before I even started doing mine. And so I'm like, you're like a local celebrity to me, buddy. <laughs> uh, I'm nervous too, man. Like you've, uh, you've had some of the greatest calls of the collectibles. So it's a, it's a melding of the mind. So I'm, I'm very excited to be on here and, uh, you know, to see just how incredible, you know, your channel's grown and just like how big your impact is on our community. So thanks so much for having me on here. Man, thanks so much, dude. I, so I've been really wanting to do this, like, you know, interview for a long time. And, uh, you know, I remember way back in the day, you got your Rizzo and I was like, so jealous. And I was like, I need a Rizzo. I need a Rizzo. <laughs> and you held it, right? Yeah. So basically I, that was the, my first VV, uh, purchase on like, like I hopped in the app and that was back in the day when like you could just buy something and it was like the addition, like there was, there was stock of it. Right. So I bought it because I was like, oh, okay, like I love Batman and this is an ultra rare and ultra rare seems like it's the most rare of this drop. So I bought it and I was like, hmm, like at that time, Vivi and Ecomi were just so under the radar and untested and there was tons of supply of everything. So I was like, all right, I guess I can spend 70 bucks on this Batman and I'll buy this, this stupid uh, chrome unicorn too. Metallia was my second purchase. Wow. And like, and then it took me a while before I bought more, but like literally in a few weeks, it all just sold out. Like everything, everything just started selling out. It was nuts. And like now looking back, I wish I really loaded up on Rizzo's and loaded up on Todd's and just everything. Right. Like I, I was just so new to um, the app and collecting that I, I just, I got what I want, wanted and end up being a valuable one. Smart move, man. I mean, yeah, and I still think that has huge room to grow. I mean, I keep seeing like Dr. Profit talking about how Rizzo is one of his favorites. And I mean, it's the first ever set, ultra rare, 1750. I mean, it's it's a big deal, man. And it says 001. I don't know if you've seen the description, but like 001, which I think is going to mess with people's minds. <laughs> and I think that's in reference to when you look at the, the set of 100 black and white statues, Rizzo was number one and Todd is number 100. Right. So that's the significance of that set. And I do agree. I think like because there's so little edition numbers of it, it's a Rizzo, like it's been referred to at, you know, as as the Rizzo for so long, like it has a lot of weight to it. So it'll always be a blue chip and worth a lot. Um, I mean, it's funny because like back then, like I remember thinking because it's it's the most rare of the first set, it has to be the most valuable. And it took forever for me to change some of that mentality, I was like, you know, like, I, I think a Rizzo is the number one. And I remember it was like your videos when you're talking about Todd and it took so long for me to really go, okay, well maybe Todd has similar weight or even the potential to have more weight than a Rizzo. And it took a long, long time for me to really wrap my mind around that because I always think and believe in scarcity over the power of first and my, my entire mentality has shifted now based on months and months and months of doing this. <laughs> yeah, man, it's interesting that you say that because same with me, like I was, you know, I had a ton of Todd's flipping into a Rizzo because I thought that was going to be the best move. But then over time, we're kind of seeing the popularity argument take the cake, right? So yep. my question for you now, man, is when did you get in? Because I was in on March 9th, I believe. So when were you in? Uh, my VV birthday, I think, I posted a while back. I think it was like February 21st. I want to say That's like right. that was like the same day I bought Omi and I bought uh, a Rizzo and a Metallio. And so like I got into Omi, like, I don't even know what it was, but it was below, I think maybe it was 19th actually when I bought Omi, but it was like 0. 0.0. I think it was three zeros still, but I bought very, very little. And then like, I bought more at like, 0 0.002 and then more at 0 0.005 and then like all the way up and all the way back down over the past you know almost a year wow <laughs> wow and how did you have the foresight to buy an nft like so early on is that because you like were familiar with other nft projects or you were just like oh let me test this out so i was very familiar with other nft projects but i hadn't really pulled the uh the trigger on really many at all um 
VV is just that easy gateway, right? Like, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people are more comfortable with NFTs now, but when you first buy an NFT, it's daunting. It's especially if you've never set up a MetaMask or anything like that, like it's a process. It's, it's a little bit nerve wracking. You don't really know how it's going to do long-term, but VV made sense to me and, and how I found it was uh, from Blockchain Andy. So I love his content. I've been watching Blockchain Andy for a long, long time because I love Zilliqa. I have a lot of different uh, crypto. I'm, I'm pretty well diversified. Even today, even though Omi is by far my biggest back. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I watched him for Zilliqa. And then he all, every once in a while, I talk about different altcoins. And I was like, eh, I don't know about this one. I don't know about this one. And then he talked about Ecomi and Vivi. And I was like, this is dope. I really like this. Like, I'll check out the app. And I downloaded it. I was like, cool, man. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll buy, you know, these, these two and kind of see where it goes. Wow. Um, so that's kind of like how it, how it went. But yeah, I, I think anyone who's nervous about NFTs or they find it confusing, start with Vivi, right? Like, and now we've already seen what monstrous potential it's grown into, but I think it still makes sense for anyone who's new to NFTs. Right. 100%. And it's so much easier. And I mean, these are characters that people are emotionally attached to. I mean, bro, like, you know, and it's funny because we both were went full in on D DC, but then all of a sudden Marvel and Disney are here. And I'm just like, okay, game over, guys. We won, you know? Yep. Yep. And that's what we know so far, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. we already know there's still a hundred plus, you know, artists and licensors that we're sitting on. So who knows what is still in the bag? Yeah, no kidding, buddy. I landed a drop the other day. The first one I've landed in like two months and I've really? been watching. Yeah, I saw, so for anybody watching this, never follow me for drop advice, follow tabs. Because <laughs> I literally suck at this. So I landed a Mickey mouse on the rebound and I was like shaking. Cause it's been so long, man, but you've been doing pretty good. Right. Despite all the little FUD going around with some bots, you've been, you've been nailing a few, I think. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, I have the best luck on blind boxes. Like I'm usually like one for two or sometimes one for three with blind boxes. Um, with the buy now button, like since they got rid of the align gate ability to spam it, uh, which I think was because of bots obviously, but that now is more like one out of six or seven. Like Johnny Dunn is the king I've seen of just landing everything. He's He's like, he's got it down to like the perfect rhythm where he just is like, boom. And like, oh, I got it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But, but blind boxes. Yeah. So like that same drop that you're talking about with the Mickey, uh, you're talking about the card, right? The, yeah, exactly. The lenticular. I, yeah. Yeah. The venticular. I actually got the secret rare goofy, which I did flip. Um, I'm building up liquidity for a number of reasons. And then uh, I also got the mini on that same drop uh, with two devices. Wow. So yeah, it's just good, Passionate. good timing. <laughs> Good luck too, because I know it's super, I, like, I know you, you know, you've hardly landed, you know, secret rares are very hard to come by. Right. I think how many do you think you had in your lifetime? Like two, three, maybe if that three or four, and okay, so but it took me a long time before I even landed one. And, the, and like the very first one I landed was the red wolf comic. So like it was one of the lowest value and I'm not complaining, right? Like I was common gang for the longest time. So it was during decon too. So like, I just assumed I had it a common, so I didn't even check it later. I just got, I got it on the drop and then I was like, okay, cool. And then like, I didn't even check until like way, way later. And then it dropped from like $800 to like $500 or something. Um, but yeah, I was like, oh man, if that had been like a Marvel number one or a Fantastic Four or something like that, I was like, but again, anytime I get a drop, whether it's common, secret or whatever, like I'm just stoked I got a drop at this point. <laughs> right. And it's funny, like, you know, I was, I always complain. I'm like, dude, I've never got a secret rare, but there was one time I got 13 or 14 Marvel comics. Number one, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> Even though there were yep. comments, like I could complain, but that's seven grand right now. So yep. like, we've all, you know, we've all hit some stuff, but I find it's becoming, you know, harder and harder. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's, it seems like difficult to flip now because of the slow rollout of the NFTs. I can't grab something and relist it. Like it almost seems impossible. So I don't know. Oh, if, like when you, after the drop? Like after the drop, yep. because I feel like, I don't know if it's intentional or if it just happens to be a slow process, but I do think it's discouraging flipping and more collecting because I can't get anything now. And then, you know? Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird because I've seen some people where they're like, oh, like I average get drop on like 20 or 30 minutes after. And like my average is usually like 
an hour 15 to an hour and a half after the drop, I actually received what I got. And like, so you really have to pay attention to, you know, what you, what green truck and what edition number and what rarity you got, but sometimes it errors out or you click too fast or whatever. So you don't get to see it. And then if you do get something like great, like, yeah, to your point, sometimes like that, that FOMO that you want to take advantage of just continues down. So by the time you can sell, it's way low. So then you're like, all right, do I wait longer? Do I, is it going to FOMO back up? Like it is kind of a, a harder time to flip them now, but yeah, I, I guess it just depends because I've seen some people where they get their, they're delivered pretty fast. Right. Um, but it's also just depending on the drop too. Like, I think if it's a Disney or Marvel, it's just going to be a slower delivery for most anyways, but yeah, yeah it, it definitely is harder now because of the slower deliveries. Right. And it seems interesting, like the trend, it's like all good points you're making. Cause it's like, okay, it starts off slow. Prices are high. Cause there's less delivered. Then over time, once the full supply comes in, it drops and then people decide whether or not they like it. And then it'll rise back up or stay. That's the, that seems to be the trend. Like Spidey 2099 was like 2.5. It was 3k went down to 1.6. And now I think it's like 2.2 or 2.3. Yeah. And it, and it works. So it's, it's tough. Like I think like Marvel and Disney, Cause I, I always like, I like to kind of like test different theories. The only way you can really test a theory is by actively doing it. Right. So like right. I've seen that pretty much with Disney and Marvel, like you, if you see the, the, the amount delivered going down, you're like, Oh, that means there's more to be delivered. That means the price will go down. And that's usually the case with a majority of the collectible drops. If, if there's a slow rollout, like a lot of people got burned on the Myrmacorna or the, yeah, the last, the last Myrmacorna one where there was a super, super slow delivery. And people were buying the secret rare mermaid corners at like 2k or whatever, like crazy numbers. And they started getting delivered. And then it dropped down to like $300 for like, and so people got burned. Right. But with Marvel and Disney, it's not as much of a bleed. Right. And then sometimes it just FOMOs right back up. Like what you said with the, the 2099 uh, Spider-Man and like what we saw with the secret rare goofy, which I did sell actually kind of low on that because I was thinking kind of, you know, with this, the, how many were delivered. And so I've learned that Marvel and Disney are the outliers for pretty much all things, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see like the game that happens with the slow delivery. It's true. And it's funny that you, what you say there, because it's so accurate. Like a lot of times I don't anticipate some of these Disney NFTs going to the heights that they do. Like when it came out at 500 gems, I'm like, oh, that's going to go down to 300 for some of these cards. And it, buddy, it never went down like past 500 for a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. So that demand is huge, right? But I know we've been chatting and I know you've been kind of in the market for a few of these uh, Marvel Mighties. So <laughs> just any, am I exposing this too early or, or did you get the one you wanted or not yet? Or So I don't have the 29.9 yet. I okay. saw it at 1.6 and I was like, and I got greedy and dumb. And I, I saw it and I was like, well, I, I think I can wait a little bit longer. Like I want to just push for 1.4. Like you always, you always push just a little bit more, but at the end of the day, when you're spending, you know, $1,600 versus $1,400, you might as well just spend the 1600 if there's a risk that it could shoot back up over 2k. Yeah. And I didn't, um, I was greedy, but I was also looking at a few other things that I was looking to buy. And so I was kind of weighing them out. And then by the time I weighed it out, it was already on the move, right? So I ended I end up buying some other things. And I still want that 29.9 because I am very bullish on Mighties. I think right. to me, and I I say this in the hopes that the 29, the 2099 doesn't jump out of reach after this is aired. Um, but the Mighties, think about how many first appearance characters that are actually like really big characters that we're getting in Marvel Mighty. Like why would Vivi allow that? Why would Marvel want that if there wasn't more significance to the Mighties, right? And I think about the way they look. I think about just what makes sense and the fact that they are created specifically in the partnership. I think about how they just make sense for some kind of game or, or some kind of gaming ability in the Vivi verse and or the fact that, the, that Vivi actually made them with Marvel how easy would it be one day for them to just flip a switch like they did with the um, with the Ritmo and all of a sudden they start moving, right? So it's like one or the other in my mind that we're seeing so many of these Mighties. There has to be something to it. There has to be a reason why we're getting first appearance Captain America with it, first appearance Black Cat, first appearance uh, uh, Spidey Gwen, right? Like 
there has to be a reason to it. And so I think that's why I love them is because I know there's more to them. And that's speculative, but just my kind of train of thought. So cool, man. I mean, I'm sure all the viewers are going to love that because, you know, I've been thinking about that as well. And I'm like, man, Dr. Doom, like Green Goblin, like Red Skull, like, you know, I heard like Dr. Doom is like one of the most popular villains in the world. Right. And it's just like, and that's, that was totally overlooked. Right. And so I, I think you're right. I think like there's some potential there for gamification. I know like nothing's been, you know, said about that yet. And it's also like to help prop up the little guy. Like, you know, like you think about all the people holding like Waltz and Spider-Mans and then all of a sudden, you know, the people that have less money are getting all the mighties and now they might be the biggest money generators in the future. So, you know, listen to taps. I feel like that's some, that's some great points, dude. Yeah. I like the mighties too, just to your point, actually, like for newer users, like new users are just joining by the thousands every single day. And they're always asking like, so what do I buy? Like, a wall is way out of price. Spider-Man's way out of pr- like, you, know, you have to start somewhere. And my buddy, I've got a few people from my bowling league now in, and he was looking and he joined like in December and he was like, all right, like, I like the Deadpool. I like the, the Groot. Like, he's like, but I really like these Mighties. Like these are affordable. I can get them. And he started just stacking up Mighties and, and different things like that. And from the beginning of December now to where we, the beginning of February now, He's, I think, quadrupled or or five x his uh, his investment just by like starting with Mighties and, and branching out from there and learning from there. So like, it's a really good entry point for new users too. Wow, that's good to know because, like you said, man, it's pretty. It's a pretty big uphill battle for some of these new people coming in, like you know, seeing those prices and going, where do I start? But it's like these are still significant opportunities, like to buy a Doctor Doom limited to 5,000 editions at like, I think like 1K is not a bad entry point, right? For something that significant in history. And you know, one thing that I really learned from you at the last interview that we had on your channel when I came there was about the concept of localization, which you really like informed me about and, and how that would play such a significant role. And I'm like, I didn't even, <laughs> dude, I didn't even think about that. So I was, I was hoping maybe you could like, you know, break down what we talked about a little further and kind of elaborate on, on some of those thoughts. Cause I think this is, you know, it could be mind blowing in terms of what the growth could be after this is uh, introduced. Oh man. Yeah. So <laughs> localization was first brought up on the VV Comey roadmap after an AMA, I think in like July, it was in summer. And I, I remember Dan said it. And I remember when he said it, like the light, the sirens and light bulbs in my brain went off. And like, I immediately covered it. I've probably covered it in like six or seven different videos since then, because obviously the VV verse is amazing. Like there's so many big catalysts that we still yet to see this year. But localization, I, I, I cannot beat this enough, is massive because it's right now we have the VV app and like we love it, right? And like people can understand it throughout the world, but to be, app, to be able to actually like use it in your own language, which English is not the first language of most, right? In the, in the broad scheme of the world and still plenty don't actually know how to read it, right? So when you can actually translate that into roughly around 40 other languages and you now have a whole nother demographic throughout the world that you can target i mean it opens the floodgates and more uh content creators like my, me and yourself right like like we have people who are presenting vv in german and spanish and all these other languages but we really don't have i think we have two who've actually done videos in mandarin and like none in tagalog or thai or you know, all these other languages like APAC and, and more, right? And I don't think I've seen any Portuguese either. So when you look at what happens to app-based companies or, or mobile native companies, once they go into localization, it is a 5X, it is a 10X, it, it jumps the user growth substantially. And then you look at something that is so, you know, mass mass enabling, like with the brands that we have, like DC and Marvel and Disney, like everyone gets it right away, but now they can get it in their own language. I mean, it's, it's insane. And that's, I think also going to be the biggest catalyst to launching the anime vertical and some other things that we, you know, that we have not really yet seen that they've talked about for a while. And that's also why I think we're seeing like the uh, Chinese new year stamps and the 
uh, the, the Scott Tolson drops that's coming up and like more and more that they're actually going to be building into the marketplace to be ready to go once localization happens because APAC is by far the largest demographic, right? And then we have not targeted it as, you know, a BV community or a Comey community, them as a company. So when localization happens, there are, there's more than just APAC, but APAC is massive and China specifically is the biggest, you know, country, biggest population in the world. And there's a big kind of no-no about like NFTs and, and using the term NFTs and like decentralized, like that's not really a, a, as much as like a loved thing there, right? So they purposely refer to NFTs as digital collectibles, which so does Vivi, right? So the fact that Vivi centralized, the fact that they're digital collectibles, it is kind of a win-win when you actually are targeting that market. So I can talk about this for like three hours, but I'm going to, I'm going to end it there just because I get really, really excited talking about localization because I see it as being explosive, explosive user growth, um, like pretty fast um, once it hits, but that's kind of a, kind of a little, little, little dump of excitement that I, I have with localization. <laughs> Wow. I mean, this is impressive. I mean, it, you know, it almost sounds rehearsed. That's how good you are at giving that speech. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, I felt like I was like, am I watching a Tops Trades video? No, like that's impressive, man. And you know, if I start doing the math on that and I'm like, if I'm holding a Chinese based app on my phone and I don't know what it is, I might think it's a scam because I don't have anybody telling me what it is. Right. Even if I, it, it seems like it's good. Like maybe I don't know the ins and outs, and I don't know how to navigate it. So I'm not going to invest in it. So it's like you said, as soon as that's there, you know, that's going to be uh, like huge, huge. So, I mean, thanks for, thanks for sharing that, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so my next question for you is like, how could this affect people's collecting strategies now? I mean, as an example, right? Like people were sitting on Todd's at like 1.6 K for the longest time and, and waiting, we all waited for more <laughs> saturation for where Todd was actually then seen as a more of a, you know, a, a, a magnificent kind of character because then it was the first ever, there was so many NFTs in the app and then it kind of started to have that reign. And so with, you know, localization, we always speculate <laughs> on, you know, characters important like Ultraman and Wonder Woman. And it's like, you know, potentially the next Todd's could be those ones that are like well adopted in other countries. Like, I think if you look at Wonder Woman, she's the fourth most popular superhero in the world as an example, you know? So I like, just like you said with the stamps, like what other things we might see once we have this mass adoption, like maybe anime and animation is going to take over the app and like totally kill some of these other things. Right. So I'm curious to what you think about that. I mean, that's the thing, right. Is when you, when you really bake out, the fandom and the target audience of Vivi, we haven't hit on a lot of different fandoms. We haven't hit on a lot of verticals yet, right? So it has primarily been like artist focused, DC, like superhero bay, like, so it's, it's like the main nostalgic brands, right? But still a lot of other fandoms that we've not yet seen. So of course, you know, superheroes are loved throughout the world. I think the, the most loved hero in like other regions by far is spider-man so we have that right. but there's a whole like todd will always be solid like that first series will always be solid because there's the power of first right so we look at the the crowd that we've not really brought fully in yet and that is the wider nft space right so <clears throat> we're seeing that start to happen and there's a lot of power of first right like that's why like the ETH rock and crypto punks and all these other NFTs that, I mean, they're, they're not a whole lot to look at, but the power of first and being a first on something really holds weight. And we've seen that now with Immutable X and other, other uh, platforms as well, or other blockchains as well, where the first on a, uh, on a, on a blockchain of an NFT tends to hold value. And so that is Todd for our marketplace, our platform, which is Vivi, right? And Vivi's joining the, the wider NFT world. So I think Todd in that first se uh, that first season and all that will have great value, especially because compared to a lot of the other drops now, like they're, the addition sizes are much lower. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, like, yeah, I think there's going to be some larger drops that we haven't seen yet. <clears throat> and that's because of things like APAC, right? So anime, if we drop Dragon Ball Z, 
it's going to go nuts. It's going to have a lot of value. And that could be even before localization. I actually wish they would drop that before localization. <laughs> um, same thing if, you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate too much, but with like Pokemon and all that, like anime is its own breed. And like, I'm a very, very huge anime nerd. Like you see the, the cosplay buster sword behind me. Uh, I've been a cosplayer for over a decade and anime is massive to the point where like more people watch anime in China than any other, like, I think it was like 60% or no, I think it was like 70% of people in China watch anime compared to everything else that they watch. Like they all watch anime. And then like J Japan was actually, actually more people in the U S I think watch anime than uh, Japan. Um, and then you also look at possible digital manga, right? Like people, people read a ton of manga as well. And actually digital or manga outsells comic books. So it's, it's really fascinating. So I think I just went to a really long point, but to what you asked, I think we will see some drops that will go up in popularity as we go into other geographies um, that are existing today. But I think there's a lot to come with localization that could outpace some of the other blue chips that we have today. Right, right. Man, all amazing points. I, I always forget. I'm like, am I in a video watching you or am I doing the interviewing? Here? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just talking back about Todd, I know you made that amazing video about, you know, 100K Todd is going to happen. And I don't know if you remember this, but you actually gave me the idea way back. I think it was like May of last year to do a video about how the first set could hit 100K. And now that seems almost like laughable. Like, I think we all know it's going to hit a hundred and now we're looking at Todd just to hit a hundred. So, you know, like, I just think it's so interesting, you know, when you talk about the power of first, because that's one thing I always harp about is like, you know, when there's tens of thousands of collectibles, verticals, VV verse land, like, how are you going to distinguish between everything? Right. And it's like, that is an undisputed King right there. So uh, how many Todd's do you have? <laughs> did you, did you harp up on them or did you? I'm, I'm, there's a reason I'm stacking liquidity. So I do <laughs> solely have one. Yeah. Um, I'm very like, uh, I'm very frugal with some of my buys. I, I do not chase peaks, you know, and sometimes if I had chased a peak, I would have, uh, I would actually have probably a couple of collectibles I do wish I had, but then I'd also not made some of the moves that I have to have what I have today. So I'm waiting to, to purchase. I would like to have at least three or four um, before they completely, you know, run away, which I think is not that far away, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, and I did that video, like I don't really do a whole lot of single collectible coverage. Right. And if I do one, I usually like to do it before it drops. Like I did this, I did one specifically on steamboat Willie before it dropped. And I made sure to do that because I wanted people to understand just how important this collectible was and why it was a blue chip and why it's it should be worth an absolute ton whether i got one or not right and it took me a while to again understand just how significant todd was because i was always like team riso right like riso is the goat here's why because of scarcity and then like <clears throat> i really started understanding from the broader nft space and kind of like really understanding just how significant vv is and looking where it is now just how incredible Todd is today and how incredible Todd will be in a year, how incredible it will be in two years. And like, that's, that's why I'm so freaking bullish now on Todd to the point where I actually strongly believe Todd is going to flip Riso and never look back. And it's, it's not that far away in my opinion. Yeah. Wow. All good points. And it feels almost like if you're an OG and you don't have a Todd, it's almost like you need it as a rite of passage now. Right? <laughs> like, oh, you don't have a Todd? Like, why are you, why are you talking to me? I mean, that's, no, don't be wrong. Anybody new joining, that is a pretty substantial, you know, feat of, of you know, uh, money to get one of those things. But at the same time, I do think that, you know, it does have a lot of clout. And despite some of these other NFTs being more scarce or more popular, you know, within the VV land and within VV, it's it's monumental, right? I mean, you see everybody now that has one in their background. I still have yet to get a model. Do you have one of those physical statues or? Yeah. No, the only one I have is the one, uh, the uh, Mankey, the one who, who's sliding across our screens on <laughs> VV. Yeah. I bought that a while back, but I didn't buy a physical. I've I haven't really been, <clears throat> sorry, um, 
I haven't really been doing a whole lot of the physical collecting yet, but I really need to because yeah. clearly we're driving the price up as a community. I mean, I remember looking at a physical Todd back in, I think like April, really thinking about it. And I was like, oh man, I really, I should probably really get one of these. Like Todd's are, are, are a thing with Vivi, right? <laughs> and they were like 200 bucks. <laughs> and now to get one, it's like well over a thousand dollars. And that's because of us, like we did that, right? So, and like, that's not going away. So I, I definitely think like getting ahead of like the physical tie to some of our VV collectibles really, really makes sense. And I, we're seeing it with comics too. People are doing that as well. So I have not jumped fully on that train yet, but uh, I plan to. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, you know, we're so familiar you Tavs, with you giving like, you know, the broader perspective on all your videos, really kind of seeing, you know, VV and Akomi from a bird eyes lens with the coin and the collecting. Um, but, you know, could we get a deeper look at what maybe your collecting strategy is and what it looks like is, is that something <laughs> you want to share it's changed yeah so yeah. like i've for a long long time i've very much been like in terms of an investor i've made a lot of smart moves in a in a short amount of time but i'm not really much of a risk taker mm-hmm. um i didn't like growing up i didn't have any money like parents, myself. And then like, I just started investing like four years ago and kind of figured it out. Right. Like I I never grew up around money or or financial minded people. Um, and so I was not really a risk taker in like my investing strategy. And then also with my collecting strategy to start. So I was like, all right, I want to complete sets because I know if I complete sets, I have a probably a higher chance of getting stacked up on MCP points and you know, that I can buy land and all that. But I saw by doing that, I was completing sets, but I didn't really have enough liquidity. So what had happened was I missed out on some pretty big pieces by not having liquidity by folks like yourself and others saying like, oh, you really need to buy this secret rare Spider-Man or you really need to buy a secret rare Marvel number one or Marvel comic number one. And at the time, like the prices were, you know, several, several thousand dollars, but I could have done so if I wasn't chasing after completing all the sets, right? And so my strategy changed a few months back. And so my collecting strategy now is I keep a lot of the season one stuff. I keep the, I keep the blue chips that I have, but I started selling off a lot of dupes and I, I wait to sell things until it's at a peak market, right? So I did a lot of selling uh, last month when everything was rallying up, right? Like it was a revolving door of like, people just pumping something on Twitter, like, this is amazing. Here's why. And then like, it would rally. I was like, cool, selling. And, <laughs> and then I would leverage into something else. And then like, I was stacking up liquidity. So there's like thousands and thousands of gems in my account now, which was something like I hadn't really happened before unless I was pumping fiat in to add gems to buy something. So nice. my collecting strategy is I keep what I want long-term and try to keep as many sets as possible for MCP by having like um easy to complete sets right like it's a one two or three so i still have over 40 sets um but i'm still selling enough and keeping enough liquidity and then stacking up blue chips when i can um and then also thinking about what's going to be the next blue chip right it seems like we're getting like a pretty big brand announcement every three months or so Mm -hmm. like we had marvel in summer like the end of summer and then we had disney in november and now we're in February and I'm kind of expecting something like unexpected and like any, and the other piece to that too, is like, if you just trust, trust your gut, like if you have a good gut, then just trust your gut and you're gonna be right. Cause every time I go against my gut, I'm wrong. Um, and I'll, t- I'll give you an experience with that. I don't have a Walt. I, I should have one. I thought like last month when we were in like the peak everything was rallying up. Right. And like, again, that revolving door, where people were just pumping things on Twitter and then they ran away. I looked at Walt and it was 13 K and I was like, Hmm, I could sell my Carmine Infantino and, if, and like three other things, you no know, three or two other things. So I had some other, uh, some liquidity and I could buy a wall for 13 grand at a high. But again, I don't like chasing highs, but it's a wall. Right. And I reached out to a, a, a VV well that I know and i was like hey what do you think and they told me no and i went against my gut and i said like should i sell these things for you and i went against my gut and the next day it rallied to 18k 
Wow. And then we've seen where it is now at $46,000. And so just trust your gut in your, in your collecting strategy among all those things is, uh, is what I would say I'm doing now to, to a degree where I'm like, logically that doesn't make sense, but the gut is telling me, so I'm doing it. <laughs> right. Nice, man. I feel like you're playing it really well. Like, I mean, I'll be honest, like I chase more of the grails and now I don't have enough MCP points. So now I'm backlogging. Like I just injected another 1500 and I bought up like all the cheap stuff that I could like comics and stuff like that, because I was like, you know what? I need to have a little more leverage because I started thinking about all the future drops we're going to get. And I'm like, I need to be a player there too. Uh, and so, you know, the MCP, man, I think you're like, I think you're right in the middle because what I was thinking was once MP MCP is introduced, I could see somebody liquidating like their second or third wallet as an example to go then diversify that overall, like cheaper collectibles to have more points. And so we might actually see some of those top tiers come down a little bit and some of those more common collectibles go up where everything's more like even keel. Um, I mean, not drastically, you're still going to see some big differences, but I think like you're right in the middle. And so you're, you'll probably have another time to grab a wall, man. I mean, that's what I'm hoping for, right? Like yeah. I, I always kind of look for like, whenever there is like that next, that next major release, like when golden moments was dropped, that's, I didn't have a bunch of, um, uh, I didn't have Nightwing. I didn't have Carmine and Fentino Robin. And when those were, when gold moments hit, they were all dropped to like 700, $800 and I stacked up on them. And so I was looking where everyone else was not looking. And I think that is another strategy where it's like, we know another big brand, a big brand is going to happen and everyone's going to be selling off things to try and, and get it. And that's my opportunity to try and grab a waltz and several other things. Right. So those are the moments where you want to kind of look at like, all right, where is no one else looking? What's down? And what can I stack while everyone's trying to save for this next big thing? Super smart. So did you end up getting a steamboat after you made that video? Oh, hundred percent. Well, now on the drop, I did get an uncommon, Okay. Uh, but yeah, I have, I have a common, I have an ultra rare. Um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of steamboats. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's a sick collectible. I actually missed it on the drop. So I only had 2k liquid. And I was like, oh, it shouldn't be because I was like partners was 1500. This has like almost 3000 more mints. I'm like, there's no way it's going to go more than 2.5. And I just got crushed, man. I was just sitting there crying. And then it was like 3K, 4K. And I was like, no way. So it took me three weeks to get the UR. Like I literally flipped. You have it. I have it now. But it took me that long to get that piece because it's like you said, it's a, it's a critical piece, man. So is, yeah. is that it, your favorite? That is my favorite. Yeah. For like, for a long time, my weirdly enough, my favorite, uh, for a while was the Loki Gator, like not because of value or anything like that. Like I just thought it was funny to play with and like just the weirdest one. Um, but I love the steamboat Willie just because I mean, it's, it's steamboat Willie, man. Like I, I grew up, we all grew up with Disney. Right. And since I think it was 2007, when they started showing the steamboat Willie before every Disney movie, like you see it whistle in on the picture before you get to watch your movie, right? Like it's yeah. the heart and soul of the entire Disney brand. And they even said it was supposed to be the first drop before golden moments. So like when you think of first appearance, Mickey in real life, that is first appearance. And I'm not trying to oversell or anything like that, but like, this was my mentality going into it. And everyone recognizes it. Like people have like tons of people have tattoos of Steamboat Willie on their body. I was at the bowling alley, like casting an AR for, I started, you know, doing TikTok just to have fun with my collectibles. And this dude who's like 54 years old was like, what are you doing with Steamboat Willie? Yeah. I didn't have to say anything. Like everyone recognizes the character and the fact that they're going to be losing that copyright in the next uh, two years, like adds more value to it, even to me. So like when it dropped, I didn't care what the price of it was. I'm getting one. Right. So, and like now it went from 2,300 or so, like, I think it was after the drop to now like over 10,000. I think it's still like very, very, uh, and I'm not saying go buy one for $10,000, but I'm just saying, I think it's value is only going to increase over time. Totally agree with you. Like my friend compared it to like Steamboat being like Amazing Fantasy 15 for Spider-Man. He's like, you got Secret or Spider-Man in like the first appearance in digital format. And then he's like, if they ever release AF15, that would be like Steamboat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that's such a good point. Like they're both critical, critical pieces. And if Steamboat was released first and it had the two tie-in, Dude, like that'd be, I don't even want to know what the price of that would be, but I, I agree. It's a huge piece. 
Yeah, I didn't think, I mean, it's also the first music we like technically, I know the cards had music, all that, but it's, yeah, it's the first music that we had for a collectible in VV, right? Right. right. It is. And I could see some really serious collectors like paying huge money for like, you know, the first Mickey Mouse in color, the first Steamboat and Walt with like the same serial number. Like, you know, these are the moves now that people could make. And that could be like, I don't even want to know what it could be, but potentially like a $500,000 buyout in the future, you know? Yeah. And I always think about like the broader NFT market too. When you have to explain something's value or what it is to someone, it's just an added layer, right? You don't have to explain Steamboat Willie or Mickey Mouse or any of that. Like that's the value of like Disney Marvel, right? Like everyone knows Spider-Man, right? They look at it like, oh, cool. He flips up, he jumps on the wall. Like that's awesome. That does way more than my NFTs. Oh, it is an NFT? Great. Like sold, right? Like that's what's happened with Spider-Man. But then same thing with Mickey and others. And I look at the new larger influencers are hopping in. So like we saw Pro the Doge, right? Like big figure in the Doge community who came in through Andre and through Foster. And what did he buy? He bought Todd's and he bought Steamboat Willies because he got it, right? He's like, I understand Batman. I understand Mickey. And so like, that's what I think bigger picture is like the value of our, our NFTs today. It's they're, they're solid, right? Like we're, we're sitting on some solid money with them, but they're not solid compared to the broader ETH market in the broader NFT market yet. So I think about what do you not have to explain to the broader NFT market who's going to be hopping into our community soon enough and they just get it right away and just buy it. And that's what I think about with those collectibles. Wow, man, like that's such a good point you make because, you know, right now in the VV context, our prices are the way they are. But when you take them outside of VV and people don't understand first appearance, they don't understand all these other aspects like right away, we might be surprised as to what moons, like it, like you said, it could be Steamboat or Todd or something else that was unforeseen that becomes like the number one piece, right? And it's like, that's where it's interesting because there's 1.5 million users within our context, but there's, I don't know how many open sea users, but there's another 1 million people there that have a varying viewpoint. So I really like that, that aspect that you bring up. Yeah, and I think we'll always help guide that, right? Because we've been around, like, we have our, our kind of go-to figures who we all kind of, kind of like form the, the value around certain things, right? Because we as a community are really the ones who are deciding, like, this is why it's substantial. And we found this. So like that t- comes to play. So I think we'll always have a say in it, but there will have to be kind of a weird meld once that community, once that side jumps in our community too, right? Because Several of several of the the community in Vivi, they don't they only collect Vivi, right? Or they're not very affluent in the NFT market space. So once we're jumping into the broader NFT space, they are now going to be coming educated further in the NFT space, and those who are hopping in from the NFT space into Vivi are going to become educated on Vivi NFT. So it's going to be this weird kind of meld. But yeah, kind of your point, like we might see some things change in value that we're not expecting. Right. Interesting. I I love that. And, and, you know, one thing, uh, because I know you have a lot of uh, knowledge about the wider open sea market as well, is a lot of people look at VV and they go, well, you know, not your keys, not your NFTs, or, you know, they look at the centralization aspect or they look at the serial numbers and they're like, well, this is not uniqueness. Like this is not like a board ape when you have your own uniqueness. And so, you, you know, do you think just, given the grand weight of some of these NFTs being like first ever Mickey on the blockchain, Disney, et cetera, kind of would outdo some of those concerns where people are like, you know what, it's still super important for people that are not necessarily, you know, too gung ho about the project yet, because that's what I always hear. Like I talk to my ETH whale friends. I'm like, what do you guys think about this? And they're like, dude, like it's not in my cold wallet at night. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm, I'm just curious, like, I don't know if like that's throwing a curveball, but um, you know, what are your thoughts on that tabs? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's, it's going to be a continued debate, even though we're kind of, we're joining the broader space, right? Because to that point, like not your keys, not your NFTs, right? So it is centralized, which is both good and bad. It's bad, which we're seeing a lot of, you know, issues lately with, with a couple of things with like flagged accounts and all that, which I get it, right? Like, like that is where there are issues with centralization, Right. And the good is sometimes, you know, someone can steal your stuff and then you can get it back. And then I think about also how easy it is for 
the broader market to, or for broader awareness for people to hop in here, right? Like, again, it's, it's not, too, it's very, very easy to get a VV NFT versus having to figure out MetaMask and hop in OpenSea and learn about projects and figure out what's going to moon and what's not. Um, so I think because there's always going to be that aspect of centralization to VV, even if we are able to sell some things in OpenSea and other open marketplaces, there's still going to be a debate, right? Like there's almost like a rivalry somewhat too with VV and broader NFT projects, because when you look at our market cap at 1.4 billion market cap, we're sitting in the top five consistently of NFT projects. And then people say, well, you want like, you can't really compare, compare VV because they're not all, you know, different traits, like, like an ape and all that. But when you look at our total NFT, you know, around four, is it 4 million now, 4 million mm -hmm. NFTs. Yeah. I mean, you, they have uh, uh, Decentraland compared in, in comparison to Bored Apes and several other NFT projects, but Decentraland is also its own marketplace, right? So you can compare Decentraland, you can compare Vivi. And it's just our total market cap is 1.4 billion on 4 million NFTs. There's nothing else that has done that, right? So it's, it's pretty crazy. And so I think there's gonna be this weird rivalry as we branch out. Um, and there's going to be some people who just choose not to go this route because you can't cash out yet. Even when you can cash out, they still won't because not your keys. Um, but I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's a miss for, for that, right? Because you will be able to spend Ethereum in the mutable X marketplace on these. And like, if I can spend crypto and not have to load up gems, I, that's how I buy my wallet, right? Like that's how I specifically buy yeah. my wallet let alone all the whales, all the ETH whales, your friends hopping in. And so there's a lot of advantages, but it's still, it's not going to be a cut and dry, like we're in the NFT space now, everyone gets it. It's going to be a re-education for some, and some will still swear that they're not quite NFTs because it's centralized. Wow. Man, what a great answer. Like, I mean, I totally agree. I think there's always going to be kind of like a yin and yang and people will like, you know, one versus the other. But the one thing that I love is the community behind it. Like unlike board apes that have 10,000 total people, we have like 1.5 million on social media, on Twitter. I mean, even if you only own a lumpy space princess, like you still have a, <laughs> you still have a voice, you know? And it's like, so that to me is super interesting too, is like how exponential the growth might be just based on the sheer size of everybody that's involved. Like, despite if you have a Todd, a Walt or whatever, you know, you're still a part of that community. So, you know, could, could we see potentially crazier heights than we expect? Like I know David, you always talks about a billion dollars in revenue this year, but I mean, we've been getting 6 million gems a day recently. So. Yeah. And I mean, we're at, at that big of a user growth on pretty much word of mouth, right? Like obviously like they have the partnership announcements, there's PR, but there's not active, like active, active marketing with most things. And like, same thing with Bored Apes, right? Like Bored Apes grew authentically and organically as well. But the buy-in from Apes, like it became very clout-based, which we are very clout-based too with our Todds and Risos and everything else. But it's, we don't have the, the, the macro influencers, well, we're starting to, yeah. and we don't have the, the larger celebrity influence in yet. So we're starting to see that though, right? Like we have Andre Jick and Pro the Doge and Dan Schauble and like more larger blue check figures hopping in. And then now on the celebrity side, we're starting to see a few athletes and a few more blue check marks hop in our spaces. And uh, I saw the other day, Fred Durst, the yeah. singer of Limp Biscuit, like <laughs> out of nowhere tweeted like, hey, VV, like, and it was kind of like a little bit of hate, like not hate, but like frustration, like when will we be able to cash out, blah, blah. But for him to be saying that, it's like, how long has he been sitting on the sidelines collecting these things? And I guarantee he's not the only one, right? So I, like, I think about how strong and, and sometimes extremely aggressive our community <laughs> is at this stage, and it's all been organic, right? And, and like, there's so much more that's going to happen, especially since you look at people like celebrities who collect comics and Disney and Marvel, like all these things, and like, they're not in it yet. And so once we actually can tick that, hey, like you can see, you can see the blockchain on your Todd, here you go, NFT, like it's not your keys, but there it is. Right. I think that'll be um, a big jump. And so the fact that we're here at this stage, like 
I think 1 billion is a no brainer. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Profit spoke about how we hit, you know, I think he said, was it 20 million, 20 million users this year. Yeah. And I did a video on it and like, I didn't believe it when I read it. And then I, I actually started doing the research and I was like, oh shit. And I, okay. Yeah. That's, that's very possible. <laughs> so yeah, our community is uh, still bite-sized, even though it is massive. Right. <laughs> yeah, man. It's so interesting that you say that because even on like tweets now, if I see like Gary Vee post something like, hey, what's a new NFT project to check out? You just see like millions of red circles. Circle, circle, circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, hey, there's no way nobody like, you know, hasn't found out about us that is, is interested in NFTs. And it makes me question, like, how come a lot of these celebrities haven't entered? Because like you said, they're definitely on the sidelines. You know, they definitely know about us. Like as an example, like Elon Musk tweeted about Minnie Mouse with that whole thing about, you know, um, kind of like gender equality and whatever, right? And that was the argument. And it was like, well, how, you know, and people under that, there must have been at least 50 posts of people posting about Minnie Mouse dropping. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, why, like, because I'm sure celebrities are potentially buying up, but why do you think they're not necessarily like exposing that they're a part of this, if that makes sense? Well, I think it's a mix, right? Yeah. So, I mean, celebrity or not, a, a, an investor who is prolific like you look at like snoop dogg what he did in nfts right like he he was had a hidden profile and was scooping up nfts for months and months and months and then revealed it after he was already sitting on like a fat bag and we're seeing more people do that too and so i think some people are doing that in vv um but also it's like the word isn't really out fully yet with VV being attached to NFTs. Mm -hmm. So when you think of NFTs, like you think of Bored Apes, you think of um, the, the Kongs, you think of uh, Artifact, you think of like all like the, the bigger names in NFT space, but VV still for the most part, like isn't widely spoken about unless it's spoken about by us and like kind of just slowly creeps out into, into people's uh, you know crowd. So. I think that's a piece, but also I'm always, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist or, or too speculative, but I'm always all thinking too, like there are some celebrities who could be in and Vivi could always be telling them like, hold on before you announce it. Right. Or like, or maybe they're doing something with, um, with Rogers and Cohen, because we know Rogers and Cohen works with several of them as well. And like they're on NDA, right? Like you never know who could be involved until they're announced and like vv keeps everything under wraps until it's announced so i think it's a it's a lack of awareness and there are some but we just don't know who yet super good super good to know man i mean that was kind of my inkling as well because right now i see a lot of these influencers coming out when they are asked about it and they're like ah digital collectibles gems and i'm like yeah but also most popular ips in the world biggest characters ever nfts on imx and so it's like i sometimes i wonder i'm like is the fud there purposely so they can stock up <laughs> like, it i mean just, it's a smart like, strategy yeah because i'm like it's you know it's about when you start like analyzing these things um you know i'm like you know gary v always says 99 percent of nfts will fail and i remember he did a video on twitter and he was talking about like you know these different nft top or nba top shots and how some of the less popular players wouldn't really be worth you know a ton in the future based on these little individual moments He's like, we're not talking about Batman and Superman. And I'm like, dude, like that's what Vivi has. And he, and I think he's got to know, right? As much as he resists, like, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, there's so much debate with, with Gary <laughs> V, right? Like he, he's acknowledged us. He's had a call with, with VV direct that he showed a while back. I mean, I think he knows more than he lets on. And there's something there to that. Like, um, I don't think it's ill will or like overly competitive or anything like that, but there's something there to that. I mean, he's a smart guy. He knows everything about everything that's happening in the space, especially if it's in a somewhat rival space to what he's doing with candy and recur and several others. So he knows he's done his 50 hours. He's, he's done it. <laughs> um, I don't think he's done his 5,000 hours like the rest of us have, but he he knows about vv and i think there's a reason why he doesn't let on more but he clearly respects our community like you know he 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 did that rebuttal video when everyone was kind of uh jumping on about the whole solana spider-man thing from dan shabelle's video and like 
he hopped on his Twitter, directed it directly to us, which, hey, his over, what is it? Hey, like over a million Twitter follow. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All found, we're like, probably like, what the hell is BB, <laughs> right? Yeah. But he put it directly to us. So like, that was a win in my book. So I think, I think there's something to that. I think it'll be unraveled eventually, right? Like the, the whole, uh, on that, that uh, Fortune, mag- was it Fortune or Inc. magazine? Yeah. Where Gary Vee was on the cover and then you open to the second page and there's Al Khan. There's too many, there's too many things that are all kind of overlapping. So there, there's something there and I think we'll just have to see what it is. Yeah, very, very cool. So Tops, man, you know, one thing that you know so much about and I know very little about is the coin. You know, I always focus on the collectibles, but like I said, you're the big picture guy. And, you know, you've done some amazing analysis on the coin and so many, so many different things that I didn't even think of. And, and wondering if you can, you know, maybe share with the viewers, like what the, you know, what your potential projection is by, by the end of this year and, you know, maybe how burning and staking and all that stuff would help incentivize, you know, the, the coin going up in, in price. Yeah. So it's, it's getting harder to like, I made price predictions and originally they were based on, you know, okay, like we could see it at the end of this year or like these, and I would like base them out on catalysts and quarters and what happened with Omi and its catalysts is we haven't had one since April, right? Like realistically, what does Omi do? It burns when you, when you spend gems, right? Like that's, that's all it does today, which when you put it that, you know, that's black and white, it doesn't do much, but we know it's going to do a lot more, right? Mm-hmm. So it's price action. It's been kind of in this lull for quite some time. It hasn't broken all-time highs for almost now a year. I actually have a video coming out pretty soon about kind of touching on some of these thoughts. But so I stopped giving like a deadline on per quarter or like that, because unless catalysts happen, the price isn't going to really reflect and then stay reflected. So we know that exchanges are going to happen hopefully this month now that we're on IMX because they've been sitting on them for, you know, eight months. Um, so catalysts are going to start happening, right? Omi is going to start to be paired with more things. It's going to be easier to buy. It's going to be tied to the NFTs, being able to purchase with it. You're going to be able to stake for rewards, which then enables people who are in BV who want to get, you know, a, a head or a head start or just a, a more of an advantage on collecting than those who don't have Omi, which is incredible there. So like people who are in VV who weren't collecting or who weren't investing in OMI now have incentive to, I mean, there's a lot of things happening, right? And we know that they've talked about burning mechanisms coming. We've talked about the VV verse, how incorporate how it will incorporate OMI. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so many things happening. So the fact that we're now burning and I'm giving, a, I guess, kind of a, a sneak peek into the video, uh, this might air after it. So that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. The fact that we're now burning over a billion OMI a week is, is something that I think a lot of people aren't focused on. And the price will go up and less OMI will be burnt, but there's a lot of things that are gonna be coming that's gonna burn more OMI and more drops to be had and our user base can, keeps increasing. So it'll constantly level out. Mm-hmm. So the token, as long as VV is successful, which I think is pretty much written in stone at this stage, OMI is gonna be right in tandem with it. But OMI hasn't really been given any of the attention or the ability that Vivi has yet because Vivi needed to be the foundation and it's about to start happening on it. So it is extremely undervalued in comparison to the vehicle, which is Vivi, right? So I, I think it is one of the smartest HODL coins in the entire crypto space. And that's why I initially invested. I was like, the tokenomics makes sense. Like, yeah, there's a ton of tokens, but they built that model. So that way, you know, BV and OMI could be around for like 10 years. They didn't expect BV to absolutely skyrocket. So that 10 year window expectation is no longer 10 years. So in terms of a, a, a few years investment for one crypto, like what you would do with Ethereum, like what you would do with Bitcoin or Cardano or whatever your altcoin of choice is, OMI is an extremely strong hold and extremely undervalued. Wow. Wow. Man, uh, I want to go buy some OMI now. <laughs> like I have a little stack. I think I told you like I'm an millionaire, but I don't have more nice. than that. Like I haven't gone crazy on it. 
Um, but you know, one thing that I think about is like, there's so much time invested into these collectibles. Right. And I'm like, man, I spent so much damn time thinking about which one's going to moon, which one's going to go up. And I'm like, sometimes the smartest strategy is just to throw a bunch of it in Omi because I'm like, Omi is like Todd to me. I'm like, it encapsulates the entire platform of what is VV. And it's like, it almost seems like the smarter move if you're time restricted as a person, because, you know, whether you're worrying about Darth Vader or, you know, some new vertical or VV verse land, like if you're staked in Omi and, you know, like you have that for a five to 10 year hold uh, and it just like you says continues to burn, then, you know, maybe, you know, what is it? 30 cents or a dollar is, is possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's super interesting, man. So any, any advice or final thoughts that you, you know, you want to give the viewers like in terms of, um, you know, collecting or, or Omi? Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of new users, new users hopping in here and like, you know, you see, you see NFT pirates and, and Johnny Dunn and Dr. Prof and like all these people with tons of collectibles and like blue chips and all that. And so the new user who hopping in, like understand, you know, it's taken time to get here and like, just know that you can also get a blue chip and you can also work your way up and flip your way up into blue chips, but don't worry if you're just starting out and you're like, oh man, like I'll never be able to afford a Todd or I'll never be able to, to get a Riso or a, a secret rare Spider-Man, all that. I think what it comes down to is really what David, you constantly says, and that's collect what you love, right? Like enjoy being a part of the community. Like if you have questions, if you don't know how to flip, if you don't really, you know, if you don't really know what to collect, like there's a reason why we're OGs and we've been around, like, you know, it sometimes takes a while to get back to those questions, but don't be afraid to, to reach out to us and, you know, tweet at us and say like, Hey, like I'm thinking about this or like, how do I do this? Like, watch NFT pirates videos and see about, you know, what has value long-term and, and flipping strategies and things like that. So I think like, that's part of my tip when it comes to like new users and the OGs. I mean, we've been around, right? Like I think every, every tip that you could have, we already have covered. And then there's more things happening every single day, every single week in this community that if you don't, if you're not staying active in the community, you're going to miss out on something because the narrative is constantly changing from week to week. So um, I'm still learning. Like I, I'm far from an expert and I'm not the smartest one in the room when it comes to Vivi or Omi. So I think just keep learning and keep being part of the community and you're going to come out on top. Amazing. Yeah. I keep telling everybody like, you know, I've learned from all my mistakes. That's why I'm half decent at giving advice now, but it's only yep. <laughs> I've had so many things that I, I, you know, wish I would have done. So Man, honestly, absolute pleasure, like having you on. Uh, like I said, I've always been a big, big fan of yours. It's actually, like, I'm still a little starstruck. I'll be honest, this whole interview is like, Taps Taps is on the show. I mean, you got to remember, I was watching you while, you know, nobody was like really giving out much content, right? So it's, it's just super cool. And uh, yeah, man, like, you know, everybody probably already knows you, I would presume that's on my channel. But if you know, if this is your first time seeing Taps, which maybe it's only three of you that are watching, um, you know, all his socials are in the description below. And I think you just went on Instagram and TikTok, if I'm not wrong, right? I did. I'm uh, So yeah. TikTok, I've been like posting stuff on, on AR and all that. Um, I've only done like two Instagram posts to the point where like, someone reached out to me on Twitter, like, hey, like, there's a fake profile of Instagram. I already reported. I was like, Oh no, that's me. I just, I just haven't posted enough on it. Like I'm always, I'm so busy. Cause like I have, you know, like a full-time job and then like content and then trying to be a part of the community and like trying to do all the social stuff. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to branch out to that. There's broader forms of communication. So you can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter. Those are my most active. Um, now on TikTok, if you like watching me have fun with collectibles and AR and uh, sometimes on Instagram. So yeah, same here, man. Like I, I watched you and your brother like start this channel. And I mean, you're such a well-respected person in this community and you've had such incredible calls early with the VV collectibles. So like I've, I've been a I've been a fan, I think, you know, of NFT Pirates and been a sub since like around the hundred hundred subs. And you know, wow. I'll I will i will be a fan from, you know, once you hit 10,000 and 20,000 and more because you know, all our channels are still small, mine included. So I think Vivi's a, a multi-year 
wagon that we're all attached to and all our channels are going to be pretty substantial. So can't wait to see, you know, what, what further influence you have in the community. Unreal, man. You're the man, buddy. And I'm, I'm still jealous of you because you got that Rizzo. So, you know, I might have a partner, but you still got that Rizzo. And I don't know if I told you this, but I almost screwed the pooch on that, on that Rizzo. So I sold off my Walt for 13,000 at the time. And I, and then I wanted to flip into a Rizzo thinking Rizzo was going to go to like 40 K because there was that momentum behind it. Mm-hmm. And then I chickened out last minute and then bought my Walt back. Really? I <laughs> see you sold it. Yeah. I mean, that worked out. I mean, that was your gut. What did we say earlier? Trust your gut. Trust like, your gut. look what happened. Like Rizzo went up to like 24K and then like yeah. is back down to 18K and partners has never looked back. It's It jumped up to like 50 and it's consolidated around like 46. So smart move. <laughs> yeah. Well, man, th- thank you so much for coming on. Um, you know, really looking forward to the next time we talk. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for everything you do and for being such a, an amazing leader for, for our space. Thanks for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Take care, brother.